It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoy this awesome conversation we're about to have. I am jumping on the air right now with David Winklansky from down the USA, who's going to share his experience and his journey through the fire service, but really dovetailing in the, the importance and how psychology plays a huge role in the fire service and leadership, teamwork, and of course, our mental health. So he's a psychologist, but he's also a behavioral specialist uh, with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation in the U.S., and he shares a lot of tidbits, a lot of nuggets for us to consider, to take back to our own stations, and to really improve the well-being of our fire service. So David's going to share some great tips here. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Until next time, stay well. All right, welcome back to Beneath the Helmet, everyone. I got David Winklaski with us today. So David Winklaski, uh, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to... Uh, connect with us and pass some of your wisdom along to our listeners today. So welcome to the show, David. Thank you for having me. Yes. So tell our listeners a little bit about who David is, uh, where you come from, kind of your background and, and what brought you to your position today as a behavioral health specialist, as well as a lieutenant in the fire service. All right. So my name is David Klansky. I have, I feel old when I say this, almost 25 years in the fire service. Uh, I was born and raised in a volunteer town. So I started out as a volunteer. I did that for nine or 10 years. I worked part-time paid elsewhere before I got the job in the city that I work for now. Um, the whole time we have a civil service system. So you take a test and every three years they offer it. And if the hiring authority wants to hire you, they send you a certification. You go through a whole process. While I was waiting for that to transpire, I decided that I needed a backup plan. And my backup plan was formal education. So I went to college. I actually started out in engineering, which not many people know. Uh, I'm terrible at it. Thank God I don't build buildings. They would be falling down all over the place. Uh, I never could quite understand differential equations and linear algebra. People would write a bunch of stuff on a board and I'd be like, okay, I don't even understand what they just wrote. So this is not for me. Uh, I actually ended up in psychology, figured out that I understood it pretty well. I uh, went on to get my bachelor's and ultimately my master's degree in it. I had started a PhD program and then the fire department ultimately called me and was like, Hey, you want to be hired? And I'm like, of course I do. Like, you know, I just like testing all the time for it. So from there, uh, it's now been, I just started my 15th year with the city. I have another about 10 to go. And I've been able to use both the combination of my education and my professional skills to hopefully better the fire service. I was hired by the National Fall and Firefighters Foundation as a behavioral health specialist back in 2018. Um, prior to that and subsequent with that, I had worked as an everyone goes home state advocate for the state of New Jersey uh, under the tutelage of John Dixon and Tony Correa and a bunch of other guys uh, who were very influential in my life. They were able to help me like navigate and figure out where I could best serve. Uh, since starting with the foundation, it's been great. I work on a couple of different programs. Programs, uh, the Taking Care of Our Own Program, which is Line of Duty Death Prevention Program. Uh, the name is a little bit of a misleading thing. I also oversee our Uniform Peer Support Programs, which contains a Chief Officer, Incident Commander, and Company Officer Peer Support Team for those members who they refer to themselves as an exclusive club that nobody wants to be a member of, which makes perfect sense when you think about the dynamic is they have suffered a line of duty death, or sorry, not suffered, experienced, probably a better choice of words. And the only people that truly understand that are people who have gone through it. So they are able to walk with new chiefs, new incident commanders, new company officers who have experienced that and help them to navigate that. Yeah, that's powerful and strong work, right? That's, uh, yeah, not for the, uh, maybe the, the more experienced people who have experienced that can actually lend a better lens to those who are experiencing it for the first time, right? So, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. So as a firefighter, your psychology background and, and knowing about how humans work, 
how has that given you a leg up as a as an officer in the fire service? It's actually an interesting uh, question when I think about it. I'm half chuckling. When I first got hired <laughs> in the city, I was introduced to a bunch of the people as this is the psychologist they hired to interview you guys and make sure you're good. Mm-hmm. So of course that made me you know the most favored person in the firehouse. Uh, it got to the point where I was like, all right, if this is how it's going to be, we're going to play along. Our training captain made us keep composition books of all the calls we went on and lessons learned. And it's one of those things that at first I was like, I don't really like this. It's kind of stupid. Like I'm documenting my whole day. And now that I look back at it, I went, man, I really wish I'd continued doing that because there's so many stories that we go through and all these calls that we experience that would just, you want to look back on. So I remember one day walking in with this composition book and I looked at one of the guys in the firehouse and he's just staring at me and I'm like, huh. And I take out a pen and I just start writing something down. And I walk out of the room and he's chasing me down. So what are you writing about me? What are you writing about me? And I was like, actually nothing about you, but I figured it could mess with you. So why not? Yeah, I don't know. Nature, you know, ribbing in the fire service that we're so known for. Yep. Uh, it's like it's when you allowed- see a therapist and uh, they start writing something down while you're talking to a therapist. You're like, what are you writing down? <laughs> you're like, so what exactly did I just say? And you're replying yep. it in your mind. I think it's made me a more effective company officer. Uh, it allows me to better look through the lens of, the people that I work with are all human beings. We're all humans. We all have life going on outside of the firehouse. There are certain people that just need to talk more. There are certain people that you need to leave alone. There are certain people that, you know, maybe they're just having an off day and it's like, hey, you know, would you just, just grab a cup of coffee or, you know, do we need to go out for ice cream after dinner tonight just because you need that time to decompress? And it's allowed me to better connect at least with the crew that I work with and some of the other folks that I have worked with in the past. Do you do any internal training on certain ways to deal with people uh, within your own team? No, no. Um, it's probably not a surprise, but we actually do not have a behavioral health program in the city that I work for other than our EAP program. So we have an EAP run by our local hospital or actually technically now it's the university that runs it. And it's the quintessential, here's a business card that has a phone number on it. Call them if you need help. And it's one of those things that I really wish we could change. It's also hard being the internal guy. Uh, you can't be an expert in your own backyard, and I completely understand that. Uh, so we're moving, I think, in the right direction. We're starting to evaluate more things, cancer prevention and mental health. And hopefully we're going to start working on more programs to allow for that. And I figure, if anything, I could help guide that discussion coming from this background where it's like, hey, you don't need to, I don't need to be your guy. I but I can help you vet other people, which is some of the other stuff that I do in my other life. Yeah, I'm fascinated with the aspect of how people operate, how we communicate to each other, how we function every day in teams and solo and, and the fire service is a whole nother realm with added the, the risk and trauma that we see. What would be one key kind of thing that firefighters could learn that would maybe reduce that internal conflict that we seem to always have? Is there anything that comes comes to mind that would be, as a psychologist, you're like, all right, if we could work on this, we might be able to solve some of our, our drama that we experience within the firehouses. I'm not sure there's one thing. So I'm going to go with stream of consciousness here and we'll go with a bunch. One of those things is obviously resilience. We need to become more resilient, but in order to become more resilient, we need to have a life outside of work. And that work-life balance is hard. Everybody talks about it. There's this, you know, wonderful papers written on it where it's like, you should only work this many hours in a week. Very few firefighters that I know only have just the firehouse. Most of us work two and three and, you know, in some cases, four and five jobs. Either they're trying to make ends meet, they're trying to get caught up. Uh, That financial literacy component of it is huge, where maybe you don't need to constantly work overtime or you don't need to constantly pick up extra shifts on the ambulance or work at the fire academy. And as I'm saying that, I'm like, oh, God, that was me for a number of years. I would get off shift and I would jump on an ambulance for, you know, two 12 hour days back to back. And then I would go to the fire academy for another day and realize that all of a sudden I'm back at work. And I'm like, I never really got away from this. You need a life outside of that. Either that's to spend time with your family or adopting positive coping strategies. Sorry, big words, adopting hobbies that actually, you know, make sense to you. Like I took up fishing recently and I love it for the solitude of it. I, stand out there like I don't catch anything and if I catch it, I usually throw it back anyway but it's mindless to me where it just I could be alone with my thoughts I could process whatever I have to process and there's still that physical action that gets me out into nature it gets me grounded again um, I'm not sure that we have the support system not everybody has a support system to be able to navigate this job 
And also with the families, like we don't do a very good job of introducing your families and your loved ones into what you're about to encounter in this field. There are some agencies that are knocking it out of the park. San Diego is a good one. They actually have a family day with their recruits. It's no uniforms. Your instructors are there. There's no ranks. There's nothing like that. You bring in the families and it's just, here is what's going to happen. Here are the shifts. Here, you know, you're going to miss holidays. You're going to miss baseball games. You know, you're going to experience this trauma. Like you know, when your significant other comes home and they need to be left alone, like this is why it's not they're trying to distance themselves from you. They just need time to be able to process their emotions. Does that happen on day one or does that happen continually year after year? That kind of um, family I know during their recruit school, I don't know if it's an ongoing process. I'd have to look at it again. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So resilience, I definitely a hundred percent agree with that. And I know we all kind of get stuck in that model of, uh, we want to, we want to be the best firefighter we can. So we'll take all these courses. We'll work overtime. We'll go to conferences. We'll do everything we can to stay in the fire world. Cause we live and breathe fire. But it's it doesn't brew good resilience, especially, you know, maybe when you're younger in your 20s, you can get away with a little bit more. But once you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s and higher, then it's uh, definitely more of a struggle. So, yeah, you need something. You need that outlet. I mean, I took up blacksmithing of all things mm -hmm. and people were like, why do you do that? And I was like, I can use fire to create something as opposed to watching fire destroy something all the time. Beautiful. And it's nice to be able to have some semblance of control over it and have it become more productive for me than anything else. So you mentioned a couple of things. Um, you mentioned resilience. Anything else pop up in your mind? Uh, financial literacy. The mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like most societies, I, I forgot what the current statistic is, it's probably 70 or 80% of people live paycheck to paycheck. So you never really have that safety net. You're constantly chasing that over time or you're chasing that side work. And to all... Oftentimes to the tune of your own mental health and your own physical health, or it's the, I can't afford to go to the doctor when I need to, or, Hey, maybe I need to see a psychologist, but they're a hundred plus dollars an hour and our insurance company either doesn't cover it fully, or we have whatever, a 70, 30 split or an 80, 20 split. We're very fortunate. Our health benefits plan actually covers behavioral health at a hundred percent, which is shocking, but it's truly amazing. So one of the things I've told everybody in my crew, it's like, you feel like you need to talk to somebody Cole, like we have a hundred percent coverage. You're not going to see that really anywhere else. Yeah. Great. That's very proactive. Uh, just going back a couple of minutes when you talked about your daily log that you entered into your, basically a journal of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned a part about lessons learned and it, I've done journaling for a long time of, you know, what I did. I had a meeting with this person. I went to a call on this, this job and uh, had an interaction with this, this firefighter. But I don't recall ever putting down lessons learned. So that's a neat little aspect of that. What, what did that entail? Just kind of your own lessons that you brought up through the day or how did that work? A lot of it was what we had learned that we didn't already know. So maybe it was, we learned something about building intelligence or something about a building that, you know, we drive by all the time and, Hey, the fire alarm panel's over here, but the fire alarm panel over here doesn't actually control the building or, Hey, there's an isolation valve over here that you're not aware of, um, different things about just interacting with the public. I mean, we, we all come from different backgrounds and not everyone comes from the same socioeconomic background. So it's a matter of treating everybody with the same level of respect. And we don't oftentimes see that across the board, not even just within the fire service, but within emergency services as a whole. So did you observe something like that? And it's, hey, how can I change that outcome next time? Or did I not like this outcome? Did we have a couple of tense moments between us and other providers? And how do we rectify this later on so this doesn't happen? Uh, what else can we do to potentially better ourselves? Is there something that you saw and went, I've never seen that before or never heard about it before. Okay, now let me write it down. Let me go home and figure it out. Or let me go Google it. Or let me go back to that scene or that building one day on my day off and go, hey, you know, can I take a tour? Can I speak with somebody? Can I go observe something? It just like you said, you know, it's, we're students of the fire service, so we like to learn more. And those lessons are poignant. Um, I'm very big on NIOSH reports. I mean, unfortunately, those lessons have been paid for in blood, and we should probably be studying them and learning from them. Line of duty death reports are pivotal in keeping us safe because 100%. it's the, the sacrifices that have already been made that we can learn from. And we just need to actually pay attention to them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more there. Yeah, they might seem uh, dry and daunting at your first look when you look at one of those, uh, you know, 50 page documents, but the wealth of nuggets and gold that you get out of that, that hopefully will 
turn around and save somebody's life, right, is is so critical. And unfortunately, those come out regularly, right? So, so how can we? We th- we this is obviously a, a podcast about the mind, body, and spirit of being a firefighter. And we talk a lot about mental health and the aspects of how that impacts us as being firefighters. How how can we start smashing the stigma and and getting rid of that stigma throughout the fire service? A lot of it is going to be open and honest dialogue. And we're starting to see that. We're seeing it more. Um, I don't want to make it a generational thing. I grew up in the fire service when it was the whole suck it up mentality. And if something bothered you, you either stuffed it down or you went to the bar and then you figured out how to move about with your next day. Nowadays, if you are seeing a therapist or a psychologist and you're comfortable with it, talk to your people about it. Have that conversation. I have a therapist. Works out well for me just because sometimes you need that objective look at everything that's going on in your life that you can't provide because you're at the center of it. And there's certain people that you could ask for opinions, but they're going to give you an opinion slanted based off of how they know you as a person. A therapist will like this be like, all right, you're a human being. I know nothing about you. Let's analyze your problem. Let's go with it. Um, I know recently I was talking to one of my guys about it. He was having some issues with anxiety and he's like, oh, maybe I should see somebody. I was like, yes, absolutely. You should. Uh, he actually went, he saw his therapist. He's actually doing a whole lot better because he could process more of those things that were causing the underlying anxiety. I was like, that's great. Like we need to be having more of these conversations though, because that stigma is still surrounding psychology and mental health is the unseen injury. There's most of the time, especially something like PTS, there's a physical change, but we don't want to acknowledge it. It's not the broken shoulder or the broken leg where we can look at it and go, oh man, that sucks. I could sign your cast. I mean, Hopefully nobody's writing on people's foreheads or anything like that, but we need to start getting to that point where we can have this conversation because people are out there struggling. And if they don't feel comfortable coming to you, they're going to continue to struggle in silence. So with your background in psychology and knowing how humans operate, why is it that we're so shy of talking about that? I'm not even sure it's just that we're all that way. I think a lot of it is we're expected to be superheroes. We're expected that when the emergency number, so when 911 gets cold, that we're going to show up and we're going to solve the world's problems. But we're not used to having styled that proverbial 911 for ourselves mm-hmm. or declare that psychological mayday where it's like, hey, I have a problem. I need help. Most of us are trained to act independently. We're trained to act uh through our knowledge, skills, and abilities where we don't have to necessarily think things through, but we don't oftentimes work on the psych aspect of it, where it's like these decision-making processes, like we can train people to do have decision-making processes. We can train you to look at things more analytically, but also train you to be more conscientious. I mean, when we look at risk-taking behaviors amongst fire, uh, first responders as a whole, it's huge because we tend to be type A adrenaline junkies, which doesn't work out very well in the profession when you have an entire team of them. One or two, you could probably manage and mitigate, you know, six or 10 of them. And you're looking at a pretty bad situation because they're going to go in and they're going to do the job. And that's great, but they might not look for safer approaches to things. You think the fire service looks at mental health different than the general public? In terms of? The stigma, the stigma. You know, not talking about it openly, not saying they're going to a therapist, just discussing it more openly with their friends and family. Probably because we have this, I need to know that the person sitting to my left and my right, or they're solid and they're good and they're you know good to go. But just because they're seeing a therapist or discussing mental health concerns doesn't mean that they're not good to go. It could actually mean that they're in a better position because they want, hey, I've identified this problem. Let me work on it so I can be better for myself, my family, my team. Um, the general public, we don't tend to hear a lot about it. I know statistically there's a very low occurrence comparatively of things like PTS because of unfortunately the trauma that we've seen. Uh, there was a recent paper that I was reading that said that our occurrence rate is like 25% or 25 times higher than the general public now, which is terrifying. But when you think about the repetitive trauma that we have to go through, it's not feasible for human beings to not be affected by it. So if we're not learning how to adequately process that emotion and how to process those feelings, we're not doing ourselves any good because then we're becoming bitter and jaded and we lose that edge. I think that's a lot of where people get concerned is the, hey, if I start going to see a therapist, it's going to be singing Kumbaya and hugs and meditation and all this other stuff. And 
I'm going to lose that cutting edge. Well, no, it actually might help you refine that cutting edge because now you're able to dial in your brain and you can cloud out everything else that you have to worry about. You could focus on the mission at hand, but still be able to bring that back in and process it as opposed to keep trying to push it into the shadows where it'll live until it's the worst possible time for you. Yeah, those type A's could be even higher performers uh, if they had therapy and clear in their mind, like you say, right? So, no, oh, meditation and yoga are fantastic. And that, I mean, 100%. yoga not only for flexibility, but just for breathing and being able to control that mind. I mean, our SCBAs only have so much air in them. So if we're hyperventilating and I'm blowing through that bottle, I'm putting myself at greater risk. If I can sit down and I can close my eyes and take those 30 seconds to catch my breath and clear my mind, it actually allows me to do it. But that's not something that you could just be like, hey, let me flip a switch and just do. You need to be a, a conscious practitioner of it. So we talk about everyone needs to know this and, and know how stress affects us, know how trauma affects us, know that therapy can work for us. But from the people that I talk to, there's very little time spent training our firefighters on this. Do you see that as a trend? And do you see what would be the nice ratio of mental performance, mental fitness, uh, education about mental health compared to force and doors or structure fire? Anything like that, any of the structural stuff. So being the psych guy, I absolutely adore that stuff. Uh, not everyone does. Mm -hmm. What I've been noticing more and more is we're starting to talk about it. You see it a lot at the national conferences. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times it's here is my story and the lessons that I learned should be applicable across the basis. And mental health has become the new big buzzword. I mean, there are people out there that were vehemently opposed to it. You know, in the you can't handle this job, you should just quit. And then with the flip of a switch, suddenly they're on the bandwagon again, which is kind of disheartening because now you have people that are like, well, you've already told us that you hate this whole concept. Uh, training days are getting longer and there's more and more topics becoming more all hazards approaches to things. But we almost need to group it instead of just mental health and mental fitness and then everything else and almost do individual skills. And like, how do we do part of our professional development is mental health and mental fitness. Do we have that ability, you know, most agencies have a physical fitness requirement where you work out an hour a day. Maybe we can incorporate into that a mental health requirement where you're doing meditation or yoga or some type of uh, mindfulness practice. And it's almost mandatory because, hey, you want to eliminate stigma, you start making things mandatory. You want to eliminate the stigma of having somebody see a therapist, then you make it mandatory. You make it on the job time. That way, they go in the room, they can say whatever they want to. It's confidential. They come out. Somebody goes, oh, would you talk to the therapist? But man, eh, tell them nothing. We talk about sports. I don't give it. It doesn't matter what they talk to them, but they were in the room. And it's not that you went because you wanted to or that you felt that you needed to. It was because somebody went, hey, you need to do this. It's mandatory. Just like uh, you know, a 1582 physical should be in most agencies, uh, an NFP, a 1582 medical physical. Like we should be doing those things. We should also have at least yearly mental health checkups. Like, hey, where were you a year ago? Where are you now? What additional stresses are you facing? Is there something that we need to look at in terms of your overall performance? When we start looking at things like uh, the Public Safety Officer Support Act, you know, has there been any recent massive trauma in your life in the last 45 days that might cause you to make the decision to hurt yourself? And if that is, you know, maybe we could head it off at the pass as opposed to looking back and going, oh, yeah, they were under a lot of stress and now they're dead and now we see it all. Because there's nothing worse than that hindsight of going, we saw it, we just didn't have the ability to frame it properly. So we couldn't take that information and put it into context. Yeah, I've heard that several times on podcast episodes now of people noticing and, and commenting that people knew around them that they were struggling, but never said anything. Yeah. It's and that whole, like, you know, we're going to go shield up and we're going to protect everybody. But are we really protecting them if we're hiding this? Or are we doing them more good by saying, hey, I've been noticing this change in your behavior. Let's go figure this out. But then we look at case law and we look at recent lawsuits where members have done that and they've gone through treatment for PTS and then they go to come back to their jobs and their job's been eliminated because they've been deemed mentally ill or that they're unsafe. And I think I told you this uh, in our last conversation. I'm a big fan of seeing like seven digit lawsuits, like in the millions, because it causes agencies to go like, hey, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Because the first person that loses their job as a result of this and has to fight to get it back, everybody else hides in the corner and goes, well, if I admit that I have a problem, then the same thing's going to happen to me. And maybe they don't have those same resources. Maybe they're one of those folks that's going paycheck to paycheck and they can't afford to miss two weeks of work for an inpatient facility 
or 90 days if they have to go away somewhere. Going back to that line of duty death and the, um, the actual case studies that come out of that, that uh, kind of help us learn and get better and grow. Is there any, can you, can you think of any reports that came out recently about mental health that actually notice and, and, and kind of classify mental health as the, one of the factors to that LODD? I don't think I've seen any recently. I'm actually not mm -hmm. sure if it's covered in the scope of NIOSH's investigation. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I could think of that was mental health specific was almost the impetus for this piece of law that came out in last year. And it was the Capitol Police officer after the January 6th insurrection, whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, where he ended up dying by suicide as a result of it. And they tied that back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't really seen any specific reports that are addressing it. It would be, I don't want to say it'd be nice. It's the wrong choice of words. It would be helpful because then we could actually say like, hey, this is what's happening. We can refer to a, an LODD report and go, you know, communications, uh, incident command, uh, inappropriate strategy and tactics or decision making. Like, we can point to all those things and we can go, here is how we fix them. If it's not there, we can't really point to it. Even when we look at firefighter suicide, there's very few people doing data collection on it. And that data is not front and center, you know, almost in like the, the flashing lights of Las Vegas, where it's like, hey, it's here. We need to address this problem. And until we see that, we could talk about it all we want to. But I mean, unfortunately, working for the government, you understand, you need to show data. You need to show the reason behind it. You need to be like, hey, this isn't just a one-off event. This is affecting this much of our population. And more so, this is what we're going to lose when they're out on sick leave for a prolonged period of time, or they're out, uh, you know, if we lose them, we lose those years of experience. And then here's where morale is going to suffer if something happens to these individuals because we failed to take care of them. And then what happens to the rest of your organization when they look and go, hey, you failed him and he had a family. Are you going to fail me next? Yeah, I, I don't have any evidence, but I'm, I'm thinking there's got to be some mental health challenges that some of our firefighters that we've lost over the years were struggling and maybe, you know, they, they weren't thinking clear when they were making those decisions and something impacting maybe depression, maybe anxiety, maybe addiction, something like that. But yeah, it'd be interesting to, like you said, not, not something you want to see in it, but it'd be interesting information for us to start collecting that does mental Absolutely. health play a role in that, right? I mean, I know we've seen them where there have been reports with toxicology reports, which like, hey, this individual is under the influence of X, Y, and Z drug. Then the question always becomes, well, well, why? Like, what caused the addiction or why were they under the influence of it? Was it job-related stress? Was it something going on at home? Was it financial? Was it something else? But we don't really dive into that. And the only unfortunate way to do it is to do almost a post-mortem of that person's life. And then it sounds very ghoulish when you're asking all these questions after the fact, like, hey, we know that this happened. And then from the family's perspective, it's, well, why are you asking all these questions? And is this going to impact or potentially impact my benefits and whatever financial support I'm going to receive from the agency or from the federal government that I need now because I no longer have this person in my life who provided X, Y, and Z for me? Yeah, they could see it as a pre-existing condition and, all right, sorry, your yeah. benefit is no longer valid, right? So yeah. A wonderful catch all. Yeah, yeah, you had it before. Yeah. So now we're going to deny everything moving forward mm -hmm. as opposed to spending, you know, a couple of dollars to make sure we take care of people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm a big, I wouldn't say a fan, but I'm very intrigued on the concept of moral injury. Um, I think that is something that is starting to get talked about in the fire service. Uh, military have kind of known about moral injury for uh, several decades. Moral injury to me, I think is very fascinating because I think it's bigger than most people recognize. How, how would you define moral injury? Um, there's a textbook definition for it and it involves you know, the, what is it, perpetrating and failing to prevent and being witness to uh, violations of codes of conduct or deeply held beliefs. And I'm sure I'm missing a couple words there, just paraphrasing it. It's just the... We have this built-in compass, and this compass is our right and wrong, and it's what we will allow and what we'll not allow. And when we start to violate that compass, we have to find a way to almost balance the scales again. You know, if everybody was raised differently, everybody has different life experiences. For some people, things might be relatively minor. Uh, we'll say drug use, for example. I mean, I don't have any necessary issue with it. 
if you're an adult and you want to buy drugs from another adult, hey, go forth. Like you're an adult, you make your own decisions. Where my borderline is, is when we have drug dealers selling to kids who either do not have the capacity to understand what's about to happen to them or they're being used as mules or runners. Like that's where my level is. And for the most part, we don't tend to see that a lot because again, it's a business, but if we have that, I know I'm going to react more strongly to it than maybe somebody who's like, oh, no, that's totally normal. Like, you know, when I was in high school, I used to you know, sell marijuana or something like that. But we start to look at where is that borderline? Where is that dividing line? And unfortunately, it gets crossed regularly. I mean, we see the, the trauma. We see, you know, the aggravated sexual assaults or the suicides or the homicides or the child abuse. And for a majority of the population, I'd say damn near everyone, like, one of those is going to be that breaking point. And then we go back and we're like, hey, like, how do we address this situation? And we go to our management and we go, hey, how do we fix this? And they go, we don't know. It's like, well, what do you mean? You don't know? Like, you're supposed to be able to protect us. Like, if we have a problem in the field, we come to you. You solve it for us. Um, we're actually, we're thankfully working on a solution to it right now. We have an issue in several of our housing developments where we have individuals who are in the later stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's becoming the, hey, they leave the stove on or, hey, they flood their apartment. It's like, hey, how do we get this person's support? And we realize that there's no direct link between first responders and social services. Like, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to help the population. But there's no way for us to just type out a memo and hit fire it off and have it emailed to social services so they can follow up. Our hospital and our EMS is like, oh, yeah, we can talk to our in-house social worker, but we can't necessarily get to yours. And then we can't get to ours. And the police are like, well, if it's not a criminal action, we really can't do it. So we're working on building that bridge right now to try and connect public health, social work, and first responders. We're the ones that are in and out of these houses all day long. We're the ones that can identify problems and go, hey, there's got to be something we can do to help these folks. Other than just going like, oh, hey, just throw them out of their house because they're a danger to others. That's not going to solve the problem. Fantastic. Kudos to your organization. So for moral injury, would you consider it to be prevalent through the fire service and maybe more prevalent than PTSI or, or vice versa? Or how, how, how big do you think of a problem this is? Without any statistics, I'm going to go based off of my own personal thought process. Mm -hmm. It's probably pretty high. And I think it's going to be one of those, one of the modifiers of the exacerbating factors of PTS, where if it's the, we didn't. We knew something was wrong, but we couldn't fix it. So now we have the grief and all the other issues tied into it. And that feeling of hopelessness and failure, which we all know, the feeling of hopelessness and uh, belongingness kind of tie together. Uh, I'm not going to say greater than 50%. I'd be kind of skeptical about that, but I think it's still pretty damn high. It's probably wow. at least in that 30 to 40% range because we're all experiencing it. I just don't think that most people know what the term moral injury even stands for. They can experience it. They can be exposed to it. But I don't think they could necessarily put a label on it yet. What well, would somebody, somebody experiencing moral injury? Um, what would be some of the signs that they might feel within themselves? Do you know? They would be, they would change their personality a lot. It would be the, you know, they're normally joyful and then they're coming in. So we start to see those, the signs of depression. We start to see um, the behavior shift, the language starts to shift from being more optimistic and positive to being a lot more negative. Uh, in the fields, you're going to probably see the change in their behavior towards, I'll say the end user or towards the, the general public, where it's the either I can't save them all or I'm going to save them all. And then they become hyper in either direction. Or it's the, you know, you go to something that's the immediate, they're a horrible human being. Like, why are we even trying to save them? And I can understand that from more of a, I'm going to say a law enforcement aspect where it's the, Every day you're dealing with people that have likely committed crimes or have been victims of crimes. But in our world, we're there to assist. The, the standing joke for us is that when you know little kids wave to the fire truck, it's with all five fingers and not just one. So Never we're trying to be positive. Yeah, we're trying to be that positive influence on people. And again, it goes back to that treating everybody with the same level of respect. But it's hard when all you're seeing is this darkness because you're dealing with these things that you don't. Know, in your mind, it has crossed that line, and how are you going to rectify that? How did when did you come across moral injury? Like back in your studies, or is this a recent thing, or um, did you learn about it? 
I've seen it before. Actually, a lot of it is the tie-in with PTS and the modifier. Yeah. I vaguely remember something about it from school, but it wasn't really talked about. Uh, hmm. I know that there's been a couple of articles in the trade journals about it. But again, it's one of those things where it pops up in our stress first aid class and we talk about moral injury and people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. And they just move on from it because they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's all the traumas and the, the accidents. It's like, no, it's it's more than that. It's almost that it's one of those building blocks of cumulative stress where you put enough weight on something. Eventually, you're going to crush it. Mm-hmm. And if you're dealing with everything else and then we tack on more moral injury on top of it, that might be the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, Definitely, I, think we need a whole lot more discussion about it, though. Yeah, I firmly believe that was the nail that put the the lid on my coffin for sure, and retiring from the fire service early, so for sure. So I'd love to uh, love to hear what you what's in your side of David's self care toolkit. Um, a lot actually, and it's been expanding, which is really great. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I have a wife and two children. Uh, they give me a lot of support. Uh, self-care wise, I've been starting to do more in the yoga and mindfulness world. I also, like most people, I have an existing back injury from the fire service. So some days it gets stiff and I'm like, oh, I can actually do stretching and I can actually work this out. Uh, I finally decided to stop being stupid and try and tough it out. I went to 12 weeks of physical therapy to be able to strengthen myself because I felt I had to be better for my people. I had, I couldn't be that liability for them. No, I have the therapist. I started adopting more hobbies. I have blacksmithing. I have fishing. I I got into drones recently because why not? They're cool technology and like I get to play with them. Like most things, unfortunately, I took it to an extreme. I bought one and I was like, oh, this is really cool, but it doesn't have all the other features that I want. So then I went out and I was like, oh, that one's shiny. It's got all the toys that I spent a whole lot of money on it. I probably shouldn't have spent on it, but I had it. So it's okay. Um, Thankfully, I've gotten myself into a position where I'm not living paycheck to paycheck and I don't have all of that debt. I don't even have a credit card. I I have all debit cards because my thought is if I want to buy something and there's no money in my bank account, I'm not buying it. Uh, I also started writing more. Um, It's been a while since I've written for trade journals. And after my most recent promotional exam, I was like, you know what? I'm already in the studying mode. So I decided it was time to actually write the psychology textbook that I always talked about and mental health for the fire service. I have these conversations all over the nation through the taking care of our own program. It'd be nice to be able to be like, hey, while I might not be able to sit here for three hours and answer your question, like at least I could direct you to something where you could read more about it. Uh, So, hey, when that gets finished, great. And if it gets out there and everybody gets it, fantastic. And if not, it's just going to be self-published. I'm going to send it out and make it a reference material. Like, As long as the work gets done, it doesn't really matter to me. Like you can even take my name off of it and just black it out. It doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not the, I'm not the pat myself on the back type of guy. I just want people to have a better understanding that they're not alone in what's going on Mm -hmm. because we see that way too often where people are like, I'm the only one in the world experiencing this. It's like, but you're not, but you just don't see that because you don't get to see it from the same lens as everyone else. So when's this amazing book going to be released? Do you expect this year, next year? Uh, it's definitely not going to be this year. Um, I'm actually starting another class next week and that's going to absorb most of my life. I'm hoping by the end of next year would be my goal. Beautiful. I'm a couple chapters into it. And every time I finish a chapter, I go, oh, I didn't cover this. And then I start writing that one. And then I go, oh, I didn't cover this. My OCD is flaring up because I start doing the, you know, shiny object thing and I move oh, to it. Perfection. And then every time I yeah. Yep. Every time I have a conversation with somebody, I was like, oh, I forgot to add this, or you know, we yeah. talked about this and let me add that too. And like even simple things like, you know, anxiety and depression, we've all heard about them, but what do they actually entail? PTS is a big buzzword, but what does it actually entail? You know, when we're talking about going, you know, go to a therapist. Well, what does that actually mean? When you start looking at social workers and LCSWs and PhDs and PsyDs, like, and then even just uh, MD, it's like, okay, well, do I need medication? Don't I need medication? Who, like, what is their approach to therapy? What is EMDR? What is cognitive behavioral therapy? We could throw out a whole bunch of big words. People like, I don't understand a single thing that means I want to go to a therapist and they grab the wrong one because yeah. they didn't have the experience. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, you know, let's be honest. It's F this. I'm not going back because I tried it. It didn't work. I'm not going to do it again. So a lot of that is just the education component of what do all these different therapies mean? And like, how do we direct it? So when you go to your health insurance company and go, hey, I need somebody who does this, this, and this, it's easier to find them. 
I mean, at least it's easier to narrow them down. It's definitely not easy to find one. Yeah, definitely short on that aspect. Yeah, I think that would, well, that's definitely a book I'll buy for sure. Cause that's, um, I think that a hundred percent is where we got to start concentrating some effort on. I, I think we're very good at forcing doors and, uh, spraying the wet stuff on the red stuff. But sometimes we got to take care of some of the other aspects of being an elite firefighter, right? Yeah, Tony always says it's like it's not hose lines and halogens, but it's still something that we have to pay attention to. Yeah, exactly. It's absolutely the case. Okay. We're willing to do that. Listen, I, I got to breach a door this morning. I was thrilled. Well, I didn't get to breach it. I had to give it to my junior guy. I'm like, no, I want to break it. But <laughs> you were there. Like, yeah, we practice on stuff like that, but we don't ever have that discussion like, oh, hey, like, here's how we're supposed to handle these events. And like, here's how we're supposed to talk through problems and conflict mediation, mitigation. And yeah. unfortunately, that's where, you know, the firehouse is where we're going to have conflicts. We spend you know, 80 or 90 percent of our time in the station, yet we tend to concentrate on the 10 percent or 20 percent of the time that we're in the field. Where how we work on getting along with one another and basically being good human beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just imagine how more effective we'd be on the fire ground if we were actually 100 percent a team on and off the job and back at the fire station, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not always possible. I get that. And I know mm-hmm. it takes a lot of work for me. There's some people that I've worked with in the past. I'm like, I don't like you. Like, I won't even shake your hand. That's how much I don't like you. But push comes to shove. We're going to work together because we have to. But it'd be nice to be able to kind of navigate all of those pitfalls ahead of time. So we work in a pretty high stress environment. We are going to see line of duty deaths, unfortunately. We're always going to see those most likely due to the nature of our work. But how, what, what in your thoughts, how can we do better as leadership to start minimizing some line of duty deaths? Because I know you're very close-knit with the, the NFFF, National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, and that's a big aspect. Well, that's probably the primary goal is line of duty deaths and supporting the fire service. And right, supporting the families, yeah. Yeah. So what can we so do better as leadership? Leadership has to be willing to learn from the experiences of others. And that's all of us across the board. Again, we have these reports that were paid for in blood. Yeah, taxpayer dollars funded them. But the sacrifices that were made by those members who were no longer with us, learn from that. Understand that we're not going to have the answers to every question. Maybe we need to adopt a more holistic approach of going, all right, everybody comes to the fire service and we all had different life experiences. So we all draw from different aspects of the world. Maybe I find that person who's a specialist and we work with guys who are electricians and plumbers. If I have an electrical question, I could figure it out or I could turn to the guy next to me who's an electrician and go, what's the correct answer? Just because I'm a supervisor doesn't mean I'm going to have the answer. When I transferred, when I first got promoted and I came to a new uh, district, the guys that were there were senior to me and had been there forever. I'm like, you know more about this district than I do. If I start giving a command that doesn't sound right, correct me. Like you have my permission. I, again, this isn't an ego thing. We're all here to go home. Studying leadership needs to be more willing to acknowledge that we're humans, that we need certain things. Like there's very few agencies that I've ever heard of that actually will go like, Hey, you need a day off because you're just not with it. You know, you got a lot going on in your life, uh, depression, anxiety, you know, kids are sick, family stressed. Take the day off, take the sick day, take the mental health day, because people like they overuse the whole mental health day concept. But take that day and get better as opposed to being here and only being here physically, but mentally you're somewhere else. So that's where we make mistakes. That's where people get hurt as a result of those mistakes that we made. Stay on top of the current trends that we might be dealing with in the field. Fortunately, the job is constantly evolving. And I know it's hard because the higher you get in leadership, the more you're tied up in budgets and staffing and human resources stuff. And I have, would imagine you don't have a whole lot of time to be able to dive into the field operation stuff, but have those folks in the field that can look at problems and go, hey, we need to analyze this. Like I'm in charge of the hazardous materials or our metering program. And I'm sitting here going, well, I just got new meters approved for natural gas because we're having an issue with detection. And now I'm sitting here going, do I need uh, you know, a hydrogen fluoride meter because of these lithium ion batteries and off-gassing and the potential to create hydrofluoric acid? I'm like, do I really want to go that insane with this? But again, if this is something that's not going away anytime soon, so why not protect ourselves where we might think like everything's fine, but this thing's off-gassing something that when guys absorb it, 
it's going to be a really bad day for them. So maybe we look at the protective equipment, we look at the the new technologies that are out there, and we look at what other agencies are doing. Like none of us have to exist in a silo. Uh, one of the individuals that I work with in the Taku program just recently retired as a career chief, and they have the Enforce program. So it's not the incident reporting, but it's actually an exposure tracking program. Apparently it's free. You could pay to in, uh, have it incorporated with whatever your CAD system is, so it pulls down incident reports. But you could do for cancer tracking, you could do tracking for hazardous materials exposures. You could also do mental health tracking. Hey, I went to this call. It was a pediatric cardiac arrest, and it's really bothering me. And it's a self-report. So now at least we're documenting these things. Because again, pre-existing condition, and if it's the whole, hey, this didn't happen on the job. This is a worker's comp. Well, no, this probably absolutely happened on the job, but we haven't. We don't have the paperwork to support it. So the more we can get out there and network with other entities and go, what are you doing about X, Y, and Z? And then in the same vein, hey, these programs are really expensive. Why does everybody need their own? Why don't we look at it and go, can we do a regional behavioral health program? Can we do, you know, instead of an individual agency peer support program, do a statewide or a county-based, or depending on how large your area is, maybe a north, a central, and a south, and put that together so our responders have the ability to do that. And hey, even if they don't want to go to the one that's in their region, they still have that option. Like, there's no reason that we keep reinventing the wheel all the time. So to flip that around, what can firefighters do better to reduce this line of duty deaths uh, kind of trajectory that we keep seeing this this rise? So we talked about leadership, what they could do, what could firefighters do? A lot of it is we're going to have to go back to those individual skills. You need to take responsibility for your education and your knowledge base. And I, you know, we work a 24 72 schedule. There's 24 hours in a day. And there's a lot of things that we can do during that day. We have days that we have mandatory training and everything else, but there's nothing that says that we can't go and do more than the mandatory training. So that says that it's like, hey, you know what? It's been a while since I've thrown a ladder or, hey, just built this new building. Let's go take a look at it. Or, hey, you know, it's been a while since I've been in that building. Let's go take a look at it. We build on those skills, but also work on those individual skills, those soft skills, work on your mindfulness, work on the, the media, uh, meditation. It's stuck on mediation for some reason today. <laughs> but the other thing is physical fitness. And I'm definitely not the pillar of it myself, but it's the cardiac is a very real cause of death for a lot of us. It's cardiac and it's responding to and from. Now, wear your seatbelts. It seems simple, but so many people, are like, but if I have my belt on, I can't get to my air pack. But if we crash and you go through the windshield, then it really doesn't matter because your air pack's going to be irrelevant. Like we're not going to be able to do anything. So we need to take care of ourselves. We need to be setting that example. As a supervisor, my truck does not move unless everybody's belted in. And my guys know this. And it's like, hey, I want you to get home to your families. I don't want to have to make that phone call. So let's make sure that we get there safely. If we take an extra 15 seconds, so be it. Developing ourselves, working on the cardiac fitness, working on fitness as a whole, taking care of ourselves financially, psychologically, physically, um, being students of the fire service, because it doesn't matter, career or volunteer. Like, I've never had a fire ask me for a union card before. It's just been, we're expected to perform at a very high level in a very short amount of prep time. So staying ready as opposed to trying to get ready, not being afraid to go, hey, you know what, I need extra training on this, or can you suggest X, Y, and Z to me? Or, you know what, I'm having these issues, you know, will you help me find somebody to talk to? Other than perhaps maybe just the UP program or just handing you a business card. But we have to be self-starters. We need to be the ones that are initiating our own educations. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the experience that I saw was when I was junior, I was investing a lot of time, a lot of money in my own self-development. And that seems to have gone away in the last few years where it's, if you're not going to give it to me, I'm not going to take that training um, from what I've seen. And uh, it's like, that's a slippery slope of, you know, you should be investing in yourself. So you are the best firefighter. Who cares if your your chief or your training officer is not going to give you that training? If you can seek it out because that's going to save you and bring you home to your family, I think that's the time to invest. That's a worthwhile investment. Point. I'm, I'm never yeah. It's weird that like 
I'm hearing what you're saying, and I know we've seen it, and I've heard that same argument where if the job wants me to have it, the job's going to pay for it. Well, there might not be the funding for it, and I'm the same way. It's the, if I want to go do something and I want to go to a class, it's, hey, can I have the time off? And if not, I'll find the time off, swaps, personal time, whatever, and I'm going to pay to take this education because it's going to make me better and it's going to get me home with my family. And maybe not everybody's in that same position where they can. Again, maybe they have, they're working the second and the third job and they can't possibly swing it. But there's a ton of low cost or free training opportunities out there. Not trying to like sound the bell of like, hey, the foundation has, but the NFFF has firehero.org. And we have somewhere between 13 and 16. I know we were adding new programs, you know, hour long, like video vignette type programs on topics. And it's like, hey, it's free. So while you're sitting there on your phone, when you're not text messaging or looking at sports, like you can do this or, hey, it's a rainy day out. And as a company officer, I don't know what else we're going to discuss. Let's throw it up there. Uh, Lexapol just did a phenomenal series on uh, corrugated stainless steel tubing that unfortunately resulted in the deaths of two firefighters, Nate Flynn and Josh Laird in Maryland. So it's like, here is what's killing firefighters. Like pressing has happened in the last three years. It's in a lot of dwellings. It's in a lot of commercial buildings. Uh, both of those were directly due to lightning strikes. But the ATF has put out great training material on it. It's like, watch it. Like, it was paid for by somebody else, and it could save your life in the process. Because what else are we going to do? If the TV's on anyway, like, how much time can you really spend watching ESPN, right? Uh -huh. Like, eventually, it's going to all reset, or you watch the news, and it's the same stuff. Like, let's adopt some type of training. FDNY has training bulletins since they put out. They're two pages long. It's going to sound bad when I say this, but ours are in the bathroom because you're a captive audience. So you drop it into a sleeve protector. And when you're staring at the back of the door, you got something to read for five minutes. But if you're captive, hey, it gives you something to do. You know, we need to be able to push this education out without regard for the it's too expensive uh -huh. because never too expensive when we need it. Yep. It's almost like that old adage, like, you know, you'll only ever need a parachute once because if you needed it and didn't have it, you won't need it anymore. Well, the time that I need that training is before I'm in the middle of that incident. Yep. So it's. Yeah. Well, but, today's social media, YouTube, podcasts, there's a wealth of information out there that you could become a master in the craft just by just by looking at that alone on your time off. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, your commute to work or your commute to the firehouse, there's time involved. Like I'm very. If I'm not listening to, I'll say mindless music on the radio, I'm listening to audiobooks because I love reading. Like reading is one of those things that you never can get enough of. And it's not just fire service books, it's books on psychology, it's books on self improvement, it's books on business and management. Just you always pick up some little tidbit from it. And you go, hey, this is really awesome. Like I'm going to apply this or I can apply that. Then I'm listening to uh, the checklist manifesto now yeah, because really you know, high stress jobs. And it's like, you know, we're relying on our brain in stress to be able to function and do everything we needed to do. It's like, why not just have a checklist? Yep. Like if I have a checklist, I can look at it. Pilots have checklists for a reason because I don't want the pilot going, I think I know how to fly this plane. Yep. I fly enough that I don't want to run that risk. Yep. I wanted to look down and go, check, 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 check. We're good because I've gone through everything that I need to go through. Yep. We do apparatus checks. We have a checklist for it. Yep. Like we need yep. checklists, for things like command and control and everything else. Just mm -hmm. it makes that decision making easier. Yep. By making the decision making easier and making that task fixation easier, we get our people home safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it doesn't dumb down the fire service. It just streamlines the fire service. Uh, we do a lot of uh, checklists in our department as well. And we call it 3 a.m. simple. So at 3 a.m., if it's simple enough that you can read it and digest and follow those orders, you've made it 3 a.m. simple. And Perfect. So, yeah, we try to make everything a checklist, whatever we can. And that book just uh, checklist manifesto. Mm -hmm. Excellent book. Excellent book. So I'd love to dig into uh, your role at N Triple F, which I think I just heard you say. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that? What does that look like in your day to day operations? Um, is that something you're there full time? Is that on call, or how does that look like in the position of a be behavioral health specialist? So I'm actually under contract. Um, and my job description really has that clause of, uh, whatever we assign to you and I absolutely adore it. I'm so very fortunate to work for them. And I'm so very fortunate to be able to use my knowledge, skills, and abilities to be able to hopefully make a positive change in the fire service. Um, 
So we have the Taking Care of Our Own program. It's a group of four of us, a behavioral health specialist, a fire hero, family member. Uh, the former term was survivor. So typically uh, the two that we have now is a father who lost his firefighter son and a wife who lost her firefighter husband uh, in obviously separate incidents. And then we have a fire chief who has had a line of duty death or near death experience. The two that we currently have, uh, one has had a line of duty death, one had a lot of duty death and on duty death and a near miss. So like, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and then we also have our boss who is our PSOB or public safety officer benefits, like guru, like this is what he does for a living and he truly enjoys it for handling things like the federal paperwork and explaining the benefits programs. So we go to agencies and a lot of it is, do you have a plan? Like we would love to say you're never going to be impacted by I want to do to death. And that'd be great, but we'd be living under a, a false pretense. We know that it's eventually going to come to our door. We hope that it never does, but there's a very real possibility. So what does that plan look like? What does that plan look like for notifying the family, especially in today's day and age of social media? They're probably already going to know because either they're going to see it online or somebody's going to put two and two together and they're going to call that individual and go, hey, hate to tell you this, but your spouse is dead. And like, that's not how we want people to learn or to understand or learn about the death. You know, what does the plan for the funeral look like? How do we address the issues of family preference and religious preference. And there are places that we have been to where it's like, hey, 24 hours, they need to be in the ground. Or you, know, you look at uh, Jewish faith and Muslim and you know, Christianity, there's, we're not homogeneous in that aspect anymore. It's not you know, the Irish Catholic firehouse anymore. It's everybody is very different. So is there a religious component that is going to kind of change the way that we're operating? What does the family want versus what don't they want? Which obviously needs to be the laser focus is, all about the family at that point. How do we best support you? Do you have a family liaison program where we can detail people that it's like, whatever you need, we have, and truly stand behind that? Because so oftentimes we'll say, hey, if you need something, call us, or we've got it. But do we really, do we have a financial mechanism behind it for things like rental cars and hotel rooms for out-of-the-area family that's coming in for the funeral? Maybe, maybe not. And we've heard horror stories across the nation where a liaison has been assigned and they go, all right, well, this needs to be done. And they pull out their credit card and all of a sudden they're ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in debt because they were doing what they thought was right. And the agency is like, well, we never told you to do that. Well, I understand you never told them to do it, but you also didn't have a plan in place as a result. Point. The story is the behavioral health component, a lot of it is dealing with the, the grief and the long-term aspects of the family. And then we also divide it into the firehouse family and those effects. And we cover PTS and we talk about suicide rates. We talk about anxiety and depression and what those look like and what, how do we move forward from there and some of the resources that are available and the different organizations that have those resources. That's fantastic. That's federally funded. I mean, it's one of these things that I go places. I'm like, oh, hey, we can come and do this class. And people go, well, maybe, listen, I get it. It's again, it's not hose lines, halligans. It's not sexy by fire service terms. It's one of those things that if you do it wrong, it's going to be bad and it's going to be really bad because that's what the family's going to remember. So we have grant money through the Bureau of Justice Assistance and Public Safety Officer Benefits to do these courses. I think it's damn near free. I think it's you provide the training space. And then we figure out lunch and photocopies. And lunch might just be, hey, there's a restaurant next door and, you know, give us an hour and we're going to go. But ultimately, next to no cost to the, the end user or the consumer of the information, which is great. That's actually where I started. I was a stress first aid trainer for them. I went and started doing that. And then my role expanded when we set up the uh, peer support programs. And we started out with the incident commanders group. We took incident commanders from all over the nation and we brought them all together. It was actually Denver was our first meeting. And it was amazing to watch this group just mesh. Like I could not have scripted this better. I was so proud of them because they all show up and they all knew why they were there. And by the end of the night, like they're laughing and joking and hugging each other, and like building those lifelong friendships to the point where they're still calling each other on the anniversaries and talking to each other. Uh, even if we don't get to see them, you know, once a year, we try and get everybody together at least once a year. We expanded from the ICs program into, uh, we redeveloped the chief officers program because the ICs were specific due to a need. It was identified that during a line of duty death, 
the crew is usually surrounded and embraced like, hey, this is terrible. And the chief officer, the, the senior administrator of the agency is usually embraced. And the IC that was there is like, hey, what about me? Like, I'm, I'm over here. I'm all alone. Like, who's going to help me? So I went there, redesigned the chief officer's program. And then we just recently added the company officer program for the exact same reason. It's the, these were your firefighters. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of you as well, whether or not whatever happened with your incident, whether it was a decision-making issue or just a sudden collapse or what. But nobody else is going to understand that but somebody who's gone through it. And then it's been great to be able to almost, I'll say, cross-pollinate the teams. Now, somebody in our ICs group was mentioning that they were really concerned about speaking to the spouse of their fallen firefighter. And it was the whole, like, they're going to hate me. I made this decision, X, Y, and Z. And then we had somebody from our company officers group say the exact same thing. Like, I couldn't face the spouse. And I was like, wait a minute, hold on with me. I'm going to text you this person's number. I'm going to text you that person's number. And they were able to have that conversation back and forth that they both experienced identical feelings, but they both felt alone in the process. And now here's somebody else who's been through different states, different scenario, but the exact same experience that can now help you walk that road. And it has been amazing. Like, again, a grant funded program. We are so very fortunate to have it. We're very fortunate to have the members that we do. Uh, they represent everything from volunteer through career, from very small rural departments to very big urban departments. Uh, their incidents represent everything from training deaths up through multiple fatality arson fires. Like we have a pretty comprehensive group, and they're just, they're phenomenal people. Like they have struggled and they've faced this adversity, and they came out on the other side, and they're willing to help everyone else who's going to go through that struggle in the future. Beautiful. Yeah. I never really considered too deeply how effective the incident commander would be. Um, obviously it was kind of in my mind that, but really that one person probably has a lot of weight on their shoulders and responsibility, a feeling of responsibility, even though maybe it was completely out of their hands, but yeah, that's a, that's gotta be a very powerful, um, position to be in and kind of, kind of lonely, like you say, you know? It's incredible. The most exclusive club that nobody wants to be a member of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They keep saying, and I was like, you know what? I like that. I actually have to write that down because you're right. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be in that group, but once you're in it, you know that you're going to be well taken care of and there's other people that understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the good work you're doing there. The support that the organization provides to spouses and partners and firefighters, is that like a one-shot thing or is that last forever or how does that support that? Last. So a lot of that is in our family programs. We have fire service programs, family programs. Uh, family programs is run by a woman named Jenny Woodall, incredibly intelligent, very nice woman. Uh, I don't tend to work on that side, so I'm only going to give you what I can recall of it. That's an ongoing relationship with the family for as long as the family deems that they want to be involved. Nice. So there are camps for children, which I believe is from ages 5 to 21 where there's a fire service camp for surviving children. There are uh, retreats or conference type setups for the fire hero family members so they can all get together and they can bond and build those friendships. There are educational components that are offered for something like, you know, how do you balance a checkbook? Because maybe the member that you lost was in charge of everything in the household. And now that they're not here anymore, how do you do that? How do you do, you know, how do you clear a stuck drain? How do you do very minor, like basic maintenance of your home, mm -hmm. which everybody goes, well, why would you train that? Well, not everybody ever had to learn that. So now here they are. And instead of, you know, paying somebody to do all these things, let's try and train them and give those, them those skills to take control of that environment some more. That's there true. are true support right there. I was just going to say that's true support. Yep. Absolutely. And it's, again, it's, People have gone, hey, we need help with X, Y, and Z. And the foundation has found a way to deliver. Hmm. And to the best of my knowledge, like nobody's ever been turned away. It's like, hey, you need something. We'll figure it out for you or we'll put you in touch with someone. On our end, we occasionally, it's actually not as frequently as I think we would probably need it. We'll get requests coming like, hey, I'm in the middle of this area and I really need a therapist, but I don't know who to talk to. So our boss will get it and we'll get triaged to usually two or three of us and goes, Hey, who has time to work on this? Call some therapists, let's vet them, let's figure out who their insurance company is, 
let's figure out who they use and like, let's put this particular person in touch with somebody. So we take away all of those barriers for access to their healthcare and we give them that support they need. Like, I love doing stuff like that because again, it's, it's direct service because we can, we can navigate all those pitfalls because we know what they are. We've unfortunately had to deal with it before we've lived through it before. So life becomes easier when you go like, hey, let's clear all these roadblocks for you. So you have made the decision and had the strength to go, I need some support. Let's get you to that support with the shortest duration possible. I give a lot of credit to uh, the family programs, though. That's that's a rough gig right there. Yeah, it is. Fantastic. How much of a relationship is there between the Canadian Fallen Firefighters and the NFFF? I don't know. Um, That is actually a great question. And I know that recently we had been discussing, there were a couple of entities up in Canada that would want us to bring the taking care of our own program up there. Mm. Unfortunately, because it's federally funded, I don't think we can pay for it. It might have to fall to the agency. I I don't get involved in any of that stuff. I get told like, are you available on these dates to go to this place? Mm. Absolutely. Let's make it happen. Uh, There probably needs to be more integration. And even, I don't know that much about the Mexican fire service, if it's more federalized, but you know, as all of North America, like we should be interfacing and we should be looking at programs. Uh, when you look at Wayne Jasper's program with the, the traumatic incident management and just being able to document things, like that was amazing to me. I was like, I read about it in an article and I was like, I need to find this guy. And then I found him and I had a bunch of conversations with him. Actually, his coin's one of the ones that's behind me on my coin rack. Nice. I was like, this is so cool. Like we're all dealing with the same stuff. Mm-hmm. But again, like we're almost acting in silos. It's like, hey, you're dealing with yours and we're dealing with ours. And you know, the fire service, I would imagine, isn't that much different between the U.S. and Canada. You know, fires are generally the same. Building construction might be a little different. Your structure and also your universal health care is going to be different. So it might add a degree of complexity, but we're all dealing with the same issues. Mm-hmm. So we need to look at better ways to kind of, I hate to use the word cross-pollinate, but that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. No, I agree. Well, like you said earlier, why reinvent the wheel, right? People are already doing this and Wayne Jasper, a good friend of mine, and he'll be on the podcast soon as well. Um, yep. So yeah, he's invented this little tracking device that allows us to track our, our traumatic stress events. Right. So I'm glad you found him. That was awesome. Glad I did too. It was actually, yeah. it was an amazing little thing. I'm just like, Hey, if people are willing to fill it out, let's do it. Like, yeah can support more people now. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I had a podcast guest on a few weeks ago, uh, not published yet. And they were talking about the challenges of dealing with a, somebody who attempted suicide, but is still with us and how we deal with that uh, in the fire service, how we support them, how we, and basically what the answer was, there is nothing in place for, for that what's your thoughts about supporting our fellow firefighters who attempted suicide but are still with us any thoughts there we need to do a better job i'm just not sure how do we implement that because we're already dealing with we were dealing with stigma before and now it's the attempt has taken it almost that step further of we always knew you were weak because people view attempted suicide as a weakness, not understanding that it takes a lot of strength to sit here and contemplate. I have to overtake every human instinct possible to die by suicide. Like it's not just like, Hey, this is a, a spur of the moment thing. In most cases, it's the, I'm about to do some type of action that is going to end my life. Where if you're ever drowning, your body is screaming for air and you're constantly pushing to the surface, like you would almost have to overtake biology at that point. We certainly need to be better about it. If they have come out on the other side and it's like, hey, I need your assistance. We need to be embracing them with open arms. We need to be supporting them. We need to be finding ways to even, hey, like, do we need to cover your shifts? Can we have mutuals or swaps or whatever it's called in your own particular agency? Or like, I'll work for you and maybe at a later date you work for me. And if not, who cares? Because maybe that's what we need for the continuation of your health care so you can continue being treated. Or if that's what you need so you keep getting a paycheck so you have one less thing to stress about. Until we're at the point where we're open and honest about mental health as a struggle, especially in this field, I don't know if we're going to get to that point because we're not really seeing a lot of return to work favorable decisions 
We're seeing a lot of entities go like, well, we're not so sure you need to come back. Or, you know, what happens when you do this again? Or it's disheartening, actually. Like, mm -hmm. that's probably what I'm going for is we have somebody who's now still with us mm -hmm. and we need to praise that and support that. But again, there's no, there's no leadership manual on it. At least not that I'm aware of. No, there's no, no way to go like, how do I embrace this person and give them what they need and also still not violate any laws or human resources. And you know, how do I navigate that? And even our HR departments probably aren't aware of how to navigate that between privacy policies and uh, health concerns. Yeah. Well, the example that he gave me was that he got stuck on a desk for a year. That was their resolution for him coming back to work after attempting suicide and surviving. And he said that was way more detrimental to his mental health than going back to work. Because you've now isolated people. Isolated. And now he's got a, like a stigma attached to him, like a label attached to him. Oh, he's, he's. Yeah. There was we, something wrong with him. Yeah. yeah that's why yeah. he's now, you know, we, we stuck him in admin because we're going to, we'll throw him a bone and we'll keep him here. Yeah. But. Maybe the the firehouse life was what he needed. Maybe the support and the camaraderie was what he needed at that point because he needed somebody to wrap their arms around him. But we didn't think that through. Yeah. I mean, if it was all direct trauma and job related, maybe that was the safest bet for the administration is what they thought. I obviously don't know the case. I don't know the gentleman. Mm -hmm. But when we started looking at it, it's the... You know, I'm not so sure that that was done with malice. I think it was just the, we don't know what else to do at this point, oh, yeah. but we're trying to keep you here. Yeah, definitely. Maybe we yeah, need to definitely not malice. those breakups. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's something that, um, yeah, I don't have the answer for that's for sure, but something that we need to consider and maybe just, maybe even just being aware that that is an issue that if that does occur in your own firehouse, that put some extra thought into how you deal with that individual moving forward. Right. So. Definitely a dicey topic, too, because mm -hmm. it's something we don't normally want to talk about to begin with. No. Yes, 100%. What's one question that I have not asked you that you wish I asked you? I don't know. I know you're a foodie. I was going to say favorite <laughs> recipe. Just quickly becoming a bourbon brown sugar uh, marinade. I made it on steak for my guys last night, and I had absolutely no complaints and no leftovers, which is always a good sign in the firehouse. That's a good sign. Yes, I saw that recipe. It looked good. Well, yeah. my plan is down the road is to put together a podcast uh, food book. So, okay. So um, all the guests on there will have a little submission of their favorite recipes. So, so, so we talked about Pisoso. We've talked about the NFFF and the programming that they're doing. We have talked about moral injury, talked about just life in the firehouse. There's really nothing else that I could think of that you haven't already asked. Okay. Awesome. So, I. I always finish my, my episodes is what's one key message that you just want to leave our listeners with today um, that will kind of resonate with them and something that you really want them to walk away with. I'm going to have to go with the, the life lesson. I had a, a mentor in the fire service. His name was Bob Burns, uh, recently died of cancer, actually. His whole thought process was take care of your people. And that's really all we have to do to make the fire service better for all of us is just spend that time, get to know your people, know their families, know what makes them tick, let them talk about their kids and their life outside of work and just be there to support them because that is what is ultimately going to make us the most well-rounded, well-adjusted team that we can be. Because if we're not taking care of our people in the simple everyday, day-to-day -day stuff, they're never going to come to you when there is a problem. So we need to make that, if you want to make it more of a banking thing, we need to make all of those deposits where every day we're making deposits because we're talking to them or we're getting to know them. Uh, so if there's a bad day, you have to make that withdrawal because you're having a bad day and you snap. It's the, they're generally a good person. This is a bad day and the anomaly as opposed to they're always having a bad day and that is who they are. Mm -hmm. I love so, that. Take care of your people. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. I think um, for some reason that uh, taking care of people fades away the longer you're in the service. But I, I, I truly believe that is the only way for a successful elite operating fire services to take care of the people, for sure. Yep. So I'm doing the work. Yeah, I couldn't agree Until more. Until we have 
a hundred percent, you know, autonomous robots doing our job. And mm-hmm. I hopefully will never see that, but yeah, yeah, not in our lifetime, hopefully. Well, David, it's been an honor to chat with you. I appreciate the fine work you're doing with the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Um, I really, truly think that your skill set is going to bring a wealth of change to the fire service. And when I say change, and I learned this from a, one of my earlier podcasts, we don't want to change the fire service. We want to improve the fire service because mm-hmm. change, help it grow. yeah, because there is a lot of good tradition and people, you know, in the fire service, tradition is very powerful. But we need to improve, not necessarily change our history, change our culture, but improve our culture. So I think you're doing a fantastic job. I can't wait to read that book because I think that's going to be a wealth of knowledge for for responders. And it's just been a real pleasure getting to know you and uh, listen to the fine work you're doing in the U.S. right now. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Until next time, stay well. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.